like when stuff just kind of pokes up out at you from the Word of God sometimes? <laughs> like every time you open it up, <laughs> you know, you've got that opportunity, right? I like this. I started doing this several years ago when we were up in Ohio. I had actually gotten a little bit disillusioned with some things. You ever get a little bit dis- disillusioned? And uh, God started getting me up in the early in the morning. And... Uh, Man, every time I'd open up the Bible, there'd be something. Fresh bread. Smell good. It's good for every day. Amen. <laughs> so I'm just thankful. Oh, she's got some bread there. <laughs> oh, bread. Illustrated sermon. I got, I've got a whole bunch of scriptures here. I want to get through this as quick as I can because it's really blessed me today. Um, you know, if you do a Google search for spirit-filled Austin, guess who comes up? We do. Is that kind of cool? What? Austin. I mean, try it once. Austin. 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 Yeah. I imagine if you just did spirit filled, you know, there might be somebody else come up. But actually, I, I had a, for a while there, my blog was uh, Worship, Worship Life Daily Bread is, is my uh, blog, blog. And if you did Worship Devotional, I would come up on the top. Then I redid my website and I lost all my ranking. So anyway, um, but, but we are, a, what kind of church are we? If you were to tell somebody what kind of church we are, what would you say? Spirit-filled? Spirit-filled? What does that mean? That's mean, I call it full gospel. It's like, if you aren't, if you aren't us, you're half gospel, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> you're not, I'll, I'll fill it to the brim gospel, right? It's like, <laughs> we, we, we're non-denominational. And, you know, there was, I, I went to a, we're going to do some cool things coming up this next year, uh, having to do, I, I, got a, I got an email to go to this thing. In t- our judge here in Williamson County, Judge Edna Stout is her name. And, uh, man, she is on fire for God. It's, it's amazing. It's kind of cool. She's, I think she's been a judge for like 15 years. And she is, um, she's, <laughs> she's a, she got saved in 82 and in 83. She said, I'm not. She, we're probably the same age, sounds like. But um, she started, she started uh, volunteering for pro-life back in 83. And so she's been on top of this stuff. And they have, Texas has a great, it's called Alliance for Life. And um, they, they, they present, actually they've, they've had a lot of leg- legislation go through just recently. that's really reduced the abortions in Texas dramatically. And so they've really been involved in this. And, and so they had, uh, they had all, the, they invited a bunch of pastors. So I went over um, to the Hemingway restaurant over on, on uh, Cypress Creek. Thank you, babe. Um, and got to sit down next to some other ministers. The reason why this came into my mind is being non-denominational is good, but you're also, you also have this element of being alone sometimes, you know. And we're not totally, I mean, we, we're connected with Raymond, you know, we have some other, but I sat next to, down to the, next to this Baptist guy, and man, I really enjoy talking with him. I'm going to hook up with him some. He's got some, because they have some good strategies, and some, he said, you know, the thing about it, he says, I don't just want people to just get in a program, I want to see him be on fire for God. You know, he's like, he's like burning with this. He says, I, I want these young people to just really be on fire for God, and he's like, yeah, that's what I want, too. I don't want people just to come in and go, you know? I want people to be changed. I, I want us to be, we ought to be, we ought to be looking at our life every week and seeing something going on. Amen? So, uh, but I wanted to look at this today, because this is some really good information. I just pray God will give me some utterance on this, because I want it to, I want it to come across, because one of the most powerful things we have in our life is this 
thing that we call ourself is spirit-filled. And the, the, there's, there's, there's this debate, that you, you know, when you get into some other denominations or some other teachings or whatever, that um, when, you, when you say, Jesus, be my Lord, that you're spirit-filled at that point. But if you look through the scripture over and over again, even, you know, in the Old Testament, it would say that the spirit came on, right? It even talks about Jesus that way. He, what, what's that scripture that he talks about? Well, we're going to go over it here in a little bit, but it says, the spirit of the Lord, of the Lord is what? Upon me. And then, it's be, and then he says, because he's anointed me to do these things. And so there's this necessity for us that, and I want to I get through this as quick as I can because I'd like for us to practice this a little bit. I think we need to, to be praying in the Spirit. You know, for things like, like what's going on with Seth right now, and uh, there's a lot of stuff going in, in, on in our life right now. And, you know, sometimes we need to have a scripture to stand on, but we need to start to exercise the Spirit. Because this is, this is how God flows. And he doesn't, it's not just a weird thing whenever he does, and, and we'll get into this. Whenever he does, there's going to be words involved. Every time the Spirit rests, every time the Spirit comes on somebody, there's words involved. Because it, it becomes a creative thing. Let me uh, look at Genesis uh, 1, 2 through 3. Where there is a covering, moving, or resting of the Spirit, there is a powerful, creative, and dominating force that, uh, that is effective beyond imagination or comprehension. Don't you like that? That we do not have to just depend upon what we can think up. That's what I love so much about praying in the Spirit is I can be bold. You ever do that? You just pr pray real bold and real strong. It's like, you don't have to try to th see what's the right word for here. Or, you know. You're not encumbered by English. And the Spirit of God just pours out, of, and it's effective. So here's, here's the verse that actually popped out at me. <laughs> I was reading my devotions, and I saw this. I saw this a little bit different than I'd seen it before. So let's look at Genesis 1, 2 through 3. And the earth was without form and empty. Does your life sometimes seem like that? <laughs> or something you're going through seems like impossible. There's no life here, right? It's just without form. It's, it's empty. It's not, not something you can e even figure out. And then it, and it says, um, And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moved on on the face of the waters. There's another translation of this, I believe, and in a, in a, um, a meaning of this is brooded over the waters. And so it has this, this sense that something is taking place, that something is, is moving, and, and there's this force taking place. What, what, what did it say right before that? It said, and darkness covered, right? Darkness covered everything. But then it says, and then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then what happened once the Spirit was on, hovering, said, then God said. Words came from this Spirit being upon. And what was the problem? There was darkness. And so this amazing thing, who would have thunk it? You know, if you happened to be there, wow. I wouldn't, you know, you all wouldn't even know that there needed to be light, right? Because there wasn't ever light before. But God, this incredible creative God that we have, what happened? Once he started to move, once he was on something, words came out that made a change. This is really powerful, Amen. Because this is what God wants to do. He doesn't want to just come upon us so we can have willies and have, you know, goosebumps go up our, the back of our neck or something. You know, that's wonderful. Don't you like goosebumps and, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> like to take off running? And, 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 and all, but what's the purpose? There's some darkness somewhere that needs some words spoken to it. Amen? 
All right. So Numbers 11, 25 through 29. Again, I've got several scriptures. I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. Where the Spirit comes on an individual, there is the placement of creative words that bring about his specific purpose. You know, when we're going through a, a day, when we're going through our life, we are a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> if we could only see ourselves as equipped as we are. You know what I mean? We are devastating. And the only thing that keeps us from being devastating is our inability to see ourselves the way we are and to operate in it. Amen? We begin to get our mouth activated, hooked up with what we're... You know, it wouldn't do, do any good. You, you know, uh, we talked about this recently, but did you ever watch those... Um, this is a long time ago now, but during Desert Storm, I liked watching the Scud missiles being sent over to Israel from, who did that? Or Iraq, I think. It was coming from Iraq. You remember that? Nobody remember that? And we had these Patriot missiles, I think is what they were called. And you could actually watch it. There would be the, the Scud, which was kind of a, a cheesy Russian missile that didn't have any guidance or anything. They would just kind of shoot it and hope it hit something. But Israel had these, these defense missiles that we had given them, actually, and they could shoot and, and, and intercept them out of the sky. Pretty cool. Pretty powerful. It's a defense. It's amazing what it could do. But if you showed up with just the missile and you didn't have the launcher, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can say, oh, come on, go get that missile. You know, it's not going anywhere, is it? Because it needs the launcher, right? We're full of Patriot missiles. We can, we can dissuade the enemy. We can knock him down. We can, we can defeat him totally. But if we never get it launched, failure to launch. <laughs> That's not somebody that sticks around home too long. That's somebody that has the Spirit of God in them that isn't activating, right? It's just sitting there in the, in the, in the uh, what do you call it, the storage unit or whatever. The, the, what, where do they put the, the uh, nuclear bombs in? A silo. That's the word I was trying to think of, silo. Just sitting there in the silo, and it needs to get out, amen? It needs to go out the mouth, and that's... Uh, so we, we need the Spirit of God. It's not something we just do ourselves either. It's got to be by the Spirit. And we have it. Amen? Numbers eleven twenty five through 29. And jo Jehovah came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took of the Spirit on him and gave it to the, sev uh, to the 70 elders. I oh, thought this is interesting. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Moses, right? Eh. <laughs> So this was, remember, this is when they're out in the desert and they're all getting their whiny heinies and they're, they're complaining because all they have to eat is manna, right? And so God really would just like to destroy them right away. But because of Moses, you know, Moses intervenes. And it's interesting that he gets 70 elders and he actually has the Spirit come upon them. And the very same thing that was on Moses comes upon these former, formerly, I don't know, they might have been good guys, but they were probably part, I bet you they died in the wilderness anyway, didn't they? For sure. Um, and it happened when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. So there's this connection. Every time the Spirit comes on a person, there's going to be an emission of words. Amen. And what's interesting about this, I just want to touch on, I might touch on it again just a little bit, is it's not words that they've rehearsed, it's not scriptures. We base our life, everything has this, this uh, you know, we base it upon, if it's legitimate, it's going to be according to scripture. So anything that does come out, but what's interesting about this, sometimes there needs to be a spirit-inspired word that you haven't ever heard before, right? And that was necessary for this moment. So let me go on here. 
it <laughs> said it came upon them and they prophesied, but it says, but they never did again. Now, we could talk about that a little bit. Maybe they could have. Because we're going to look, a lot of times, whenever the Spirit comes upon somebody, we'll look at this a little bit later, is it never leaves. It always has that capacity. Even if they're not living for God. Because, <laughs> uh, right, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it says of these, of these uh, 70 guys, there's two of them that, that stay behind for some reason. But two of the men stayed in the camp. They didn't go out outside the camp with all the rest of them. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. Maybe they were twins. Huh? And, and the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of those who were written, but did not go out to the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. So even though they didn't go out with the other guys, they still had the Spirit on them. And what did they do? They prophesied inside the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses. He's tattletaling on them, right? They're out of line, Moses. You need... I, he, maybe he wanted some fireworks. Maybe he, he said, I want to see them get struck down. That would be kind of cool. Or maybe he didn't like them. I don't know. And, and the young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, make them cease. They can't do that. <laughs> you only can be Moses, you only can be Joshua. you got to have the right qualifications. And then Moses responds, isn't this a humble response? He said, I'd rather have some wildfire than no fire. Right? Right? So I'd rather have somebody prophesying than not prophesying, right? All right, my thing went to sleep on me here. Um, and Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would God that all Jehovah's people were prophets? This is Jesus' heart, isn't it? That Jehovah would put his spirit upon them. Amen? And this is where they're all going towards. This is where Jesus takes us. Amen? One, one more uh, passage here. Psalms uh, 104.30. You send forth your spirit. They are created. And you renew the face of the earth. What happens when he sends forth his spirit? Creative force takes place. Amen? Amen. Yes. And then what? You renew the face of the earth. God wants to do something on this earth right now. And who's he, how's it going to be accomplished? Amen? By us. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just got some examples here. Just going through some, some examples from the Old Testament. Um. Numbers 27, 18. Joshua, the Spirit came upon him by the laying on of Moses' hands. So there's this transformation. We did this on Sunday, didn't we? And Daniel said something interesting at the end there because it's very important that you don't just think that some man laid his hands on you, right? I thought about this, that there was some laying on of hands that took place with Joshua. And Joshua could have said, oh, I know Moses. I've seen him blow his nose. <laughs> you know, I've seen him do some other things, but, you know, <laughs> I won't get too detailed. I know him as a man. He didn't see that, right? Because he was the one that actually got to fulfill the promise of God that was made to Moses. He's the one that actually got to go into the promised land. Why? Because he had the spirit, the laying on of hands, but he honored it, didn't he? Amen? And it was significant. There must be honor for the moment of the impartation that enables living out the spirit's purpose. If we're going to actually live it out... 
We're going to have to honor it. You know, uh, you know, I have my son here. This, this tends to be a problem a lot of times for, for pastor's kids. I was, I was, I'm a pastor's kid myself. But, you know, you know your dad too well. <laughs> Hayden knows me way too well. And so sometimes there can be a less than complete honor for what's happening. What's happening to me right now, and, and I'll, I'll just declare this because I, I lean upon it. I trust it, that the Spirit is on me right now. That what I'm saying right now isn't just by me. In fact, I could, I could guarantee that. Because you follow, follow me around during the day and I just don't talk that much. You know? <laughs> I don't have that much to say. But when you get full of the Spirit, you got something to say. Amen? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, you're supposed to validate what I'm saying. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, see, be quiet and honor me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Numbers 27, 18. And Joshua said to Moses, or Jehovah said to, to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him. So this could kind of go to the, to the salvation uh, thing. He had the Spirit in him, but he needed the Spirit in him on him right there was another thing that needed to take place here and so it says that in deuteronomy there or in, in numbers and let, let's go to deuteronomy now and it'll refer to what happened right then 34 9 deuteronomy 34 9 and joshua the son of nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands on him. And the sons of Israel listened to him and did as Jehovah commanded Moses. So what, what point is this? This is right after Moses died, isn't it? And there is a need here for a transfer of leadership. Uh, uh, Joshua's going to have to stand up and, 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 and be the leader. For that to take place, he's going to have to be full of the Spirit. Not just full of the Spirit, but he's going to have to be recognized as it, right? Because the people are going to have to follow him. They're going to have to do what he says. Remember, they, what do they do right after this? They go into Jericho, and they have to be quiet and talk, walk around this, these walls for seven days. And they do it. Why? Because they recognize the Spirit of God. And also, they know that Moses laid his hands on him, Right? Othniel. Anybody ever heard of Othniel? We have some new kids' names, right? You can name your first child Othniel. Get in here, Othniel. Okay. Jud Judges 3, 8 through 10. When, when Jehovah came upon him, upon Othniel, he delivered his enemy into his hand. There's just a lot of references in the Old Testament here about the Spirit coming on. And the anger of Jehovah was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand. Uh, I'm going to give this a shot. Cushan Rishathaim. And I'm just going to call him Cush after that if there's said it again. King of Mesopotamia. And the sons of Israel served Cush eight years. So they were, they were slaves to them for eight years, right? And when the sons of Israel cried to Jehovah, Jehovah raised up a deliverer to the sons of Israel. Who delivered them? Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother, Canaz. And the spirit of Jehovah was, uh, Jehovah what? It came upon him, right? And he judged Israel and went out to war. And Jehovah delivered Cush, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against Cush. Why? Because the Spirit of God came upon him, right? So there's this element of when the Spirit comes on you, you have a capacity to defeat your enemies. Amen? Amen. And it's not just you doing it anymore. It's God. I mean, you go back to Joshua, everything he did going into the, into the promised land was by the Spirit of God being upon him. 
All the while we're going through these, I just want to keep pointing out that there's a necessity to have the Spirit on you, to, for you to be full of the Spirit. In this case, it meant life or death, didn't it? It's critical. That's why I don't just want to be somebody that says, all I need to do is memorize a bunch of scriptures and just, I'm just a Bible. I want to be full of the Spirit. Because the scriptures are spirit in their life. Amen? So it needs to be more than just an, a mental understanding. In this case, Othniel had the Spirit come upon him. And because he did, he was able to deliver Israel from their enemy. Amen? Next one is the name of our new little dog, Samson. Judges 14, 19. And here's an interesting thing about it. I just want to point out, and it should be a comfort to us too sometimes, because what, the, what does the enemy do? <laughs> this, this actually happened this week. Is when you, sometimes when you have your, 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 your greatest demonstration of the Spirit of God, what will happen right away? The enemy wants to come and steal it, doesn't he? And so you're going to get attacked. And so what, what the biggest thing that the attack is doing is not what you're getting at the moment. Remember, we talked, we, I preached about this a couple weeks ago, I think. When you think that you're defeated, that's not, that's not the defeat that the enemy is wanting to get. He's wanting to get you to give up on God, to get your mouth shut, and to keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because what happened with Samson is you wouldn't have even thought he was a man of God at all. But he was full of the Holy Ghost. So when the enemy comes and tries to start accusing us of this because something going on in our life, well, that must not be legitimate. No, you say, no, nah, I got a reason to understand that once the Spirit came upon me, he's upon me. And he's not living or leaving. Amen? He's here. He's on me. Where the Spirit is, there's a force that doesn't necessarily validate all the actions of the one on whom it rests. There's another thing that goes along this with this that my son can take uh, understanding of. Is just because I'm not always perfect, and I might demonstrate anger from time to time or something else, that doesn't mean that God isn't upon me. You know, And so we can do that in a church setting. This has happened a lot of times. Some spiritual leader goes through some kind of a falling of some kind, and people miss out on what God wants to do, maybe through that same person, because they judge him, and they say, well, they're, and then they disqualify God altogether, and they say, oh, must not be real. No, when the Spirit comes upon, it doesn't necessarily, it's not, it's not validation of everything they're going to do, but it's legitimate, Amen. So, Judges 14, 19, and the Spirit of Jehovah came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 men of them, and took their spoil and gave changes of garments to them, who told what the riddle meant. Okay, uh, we don't need to go too much into that. The main thing is, is the Spirit came on him. He would get drunk, he would be, you know, doing all kinds of junk, but it would say the Spirit came on him. Amen? Amen? This is a force. This, when it hovers, it creates. When it hovers, it produces. It protects. It does things. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You got to validate it. You got to honor it. You got to operate it. Yes. Amen. Amen? And it's so necessary to, to consider these things. You know, um, I, I want us to operate in it a little bit. But we have to have an uh, understanding of it, too. That when we're praying in the Spirit, it's not just optional. It's, it's serious stuff. It's the Spirit hovering over us, producing something effective. Amen? And when we go to pray in the Spirit, we begin to understand that things, forces are taking place. Amen? Okay, uh, King Saul, 1 Samuel 10, 6-7. The Spirit transforms and enables, but doesn't guarantee the optimal end either. <laughs> that is only secured in a lifestyle of worship. I just wanted to contrast King Saul, right? He was anointed too. And let's look at this passage real quick. 
1 Samuel 10, 6 through 7. And the Spirit of Jehovah will come powerfully on you. Who's saying this? Samuel, right? And you shall prophesy with them. He's going to encounter some, some uh, prophets, right? And shall be turned into another man. And it will be when these signs have come to you, you will do for yourself whatever your hand finds, for God is with you. Okay, just real quick, here's a problem that you have to be careful for when you understand that the Spirit comes upon you, turns you into another man. What was King Saul's problem with that? He started to think that everything he did was okay. Right? Right? And that he didn't even need God anymore. What was the difference between him and David? David always went to the face of God. He never exalted his anointing above the face of God. Amen? And what did it do? It preserved his end. Just because I'm anointed today doesn't mean I'm going to end up blessed. I will have the anointing. And it's interesting, Saul was anointed all the way to the end. But he just kept, he didn't know how to worship, to let himself be humbled in the presence of God, right? So in the midst of this, we have to understand that being full of, being the spirit-filled church in town doesn't elevate us above anybody else. And what we have to do is hit our knees continually and realize that we are just a silo that God wants to speak through. Every time he does, it's him doing the work. Yeah. It's not us at all. Right. He empowers us. He enables us. But we're just a banner of his glory. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So I got David coming up here next. 1 Samuel 16, 13. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of Jehovah came on David. From that day forward. And again, what's interesting is, is uh, David had a lot of shenanigans too, didn't he? But it says from that day forward, he was on him. Amen? From the moment the Spirit comes upon, there's a continuance of his residence. Though there may be variance in his demonstration, it doesn't guarantee an unopposed path. Just because we have the Spirit of God come upon us doesn't mean it's all going to be light and bright. David spent a large portion of his life exiled, didn't he? He even lived with the Philistines for a, quite a while. Right? It wasn't just... It just wasn't all roses just because he got filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? Okay, I've got some prophecies of Jesus. How many know that the Spirit came on Jesus? Amen? Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. And what's interesting about this is you begin to see what the Spirit, the nature of the Spirit, when it comes on us, it's, it's for a purpose. Amen? Amen? So that when we, and I like, I, like, I like seeing this out of Genesis because what happens is the Spirit starts to hover. And we can make a hover pad for, for the Spirit, right? <laughs> hover over me, right? <laughs> we can create that atmosphere for the Spirit to hover. But when He does, it's going to engage our mouth, but it's with great purpose. Because where the Spirit is, there's the nature of the Spirit, which is drawn out in here. And a shoot or a root goes out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of Jehovah shall what? Rest on him. Isn't that interesting? Even Jesus had the Spirit on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. Whoa, it's going to produce some different things in us, isn't it? 
And he is made to breathe in the fear of Jehovah. And he shall not judge according to the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. <laughs> well, this is a directive, isn't it? We don't judge by what we see or what we hear, do we? But it's by the Spirit. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and shall decide with uprightness for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his heart. That's the nature of the Spirit when it comes on you. Amen? So look at Isaiah 61, 1 through 5, or 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord Jehovah, and this is what Jesus got up in front of the whole council and, and he first threatened to be stoned, right? I believe. <laughs> it's like, but that was the launching of his ministry, too, wasn't it? When he declared this thing from his mouth. The Spirit of the Lord. Jehovah is what? On me. <laughs> this on stuff is pretty significant. Because Jehovah has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. What's all that's taking place right now? <laughs> Words are coming out of you, aren't they? Where there was darkness, words are being spoken. Light is being brought. Amen? Yeah. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound to preach the acceptable year of Jehovah and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to appoint to those who mourn in Zion, to give to them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Jehovah, that he might be glorified. You could almost put all this in, in verse. Without the Spirit on, there is none. Right? But when the Spirit is on, words are hovered over by the Spirit that enable. Amen? <laughs> okay, let's go to Isaiah 59, 19 through 21. Is this good stuff? Yes. Amen. Amen. The Spirit's presence is a powerful defense that is equipped and dispensed by the placement of words in our mouths. Words from the Scriptures, but also words that come directly by the Spirit. Let me just say that again. The Spirit's presence is a powerful, and when I say the Spirit's presence upon us, amen, is a powerful defense that is equipped and dispensed by the placement of words in our mouths. Words from the scriptures, but also words that come directly by the Spirit. Isaiah 59, 19 through 21. So they shall fear the name of Jehovah from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of Jehovah shall make him flee. And, re and the Redeemer, you know, a lot of times we just camp out on that verse, don't we? It's a fun place to hang out. When, this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him, right? But if you keep going here, it's kind of interesting. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says Jehovah, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says Jehovah. My Spirit that is on you, and my words which I have put where? In your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed seeds, seed, says Jehovah, from now on and forever. What is he saying here? My spirit's going to be on you, and how that's going to be evidenced is what's in your mouth. Right? And I believe... That the part that we like to, to, to refer to is when the enemy comes in like a flood, how is he going to flee? What do we do? You resist the devil and he will flee, right? Yeah. Why does he flee? The Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard from where? From your mouth. How is the, 
enemy pushed back when he comes in like a flood by the Spirit on us. Amen? So when I get filled with the Holy Spirit, I better not just be a a decaying puddle. (laughs) I need to be a spring of living water. Amen? It says, I have put these words in your mouth. They better not depart from your mouth. It's kind of interesting. How would they depart from your mouth? (laughs) It's not that you say them and they go somewhere. And No, it's when they cease to keep coming out of your mouth. Amen? It needs to be something that is a continuous flow. Amen. That's right where I'm going. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> that's cool that you saw. That you're segueing me here. <laughs> this begins to make Acts two in, in Jesus. Uh, what Jesus says, and it makes it come alive, doesn't it? You begin to see it in the context and the how important it is. Jesus lived by the Spirit being on him. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he found himself in the scriptures. Man, last week, last Wednesday, what did we talk about? Oh, you guys missed it. Jesus talked from the second person. He would talk about himself all the time, right? He found himself in the scripture. And what's the first thing that he found in the scripture that he declared to the world? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He didn't say, here I am, the Son of God, listen to me because I'm the Son of God. No, he said, the Spirit of God is upon me because he's anointed me. Isn't that interesting? (laughs) He didn't come of his own anointing even. He came of the anointing of Almighty God upon him. Amen? So, uh, let's look at John 16, 7. Jesus emphasizes the Spirit even above his own physical presence. I hadn't seen this before. Kind of magnifies it. He said, you don't need me physically. In fact, you need me. This is Jesus. You need me to leave. This is how important it is that the Spirit be on you. You need me to leave because if I don't, he's not going to come on you. So Jesus left. Why? Why? So that the Spirit would come on us. Our connection to and understanding of Jesus himself is in desperate need of the Spirit being upon us, evidenced by what is in our mouth. Amen? Don't tell, you know, (laughs) I don't want to be too heavy on this, but he said, you're going to know me because the Spirit's on, on you. So don't, don't diminish the power of the Spirit. <laughs> I'm not, not to be too mean, but if you really know Jesus, it's not going to be just because you have a lot of stuff about him in your brain. It's going to be a heart-to-heart, Spirit-on-you experience, right? John 16, 7. But I tell you the truth, it is expedient. What does that mean? It has to happen. Right? For you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. (laughs) If I don't go, he's not coming. You know, you could, if you were there at that moment, you say, Jesus, why can't we just have both? Let's have you and John 14, 26. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit from the Father, will I send in my name. He shall teach you all things 
and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. So when the Spirit comes on, when we're full of the Spirit, what are we being shown? Jesus. Amen? It comes, when the Spirit comes on us, it's coming in the name of Jesus. Amen? And we get full of Him, and what's going to happen then? Everything, He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he said, I'm going to go away, and that same spirit is going to come on you. Amen? One more. One more passage. Acts 2, 2 through 4. And we're all familiar with this. All upon, the, uh, all upon whom the spirit rests effectively evidence him by what is in their mouth. To me, this is critical. Um, you know, I've been taught this since a kid. That when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak in other tongues. That's how it happened in the, Old, in the New Testament, right? It's an evidence. And, it, and, and if you go back to Genesis 1 there, there's this, there's this reinforcement of this idea. When the Spirit hovers, when He's on, there's a production of, of language, of creative force that's in our words. Amen? And it's not limited what happened... With the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's no longer limited to what we can think up in our brains. Amen? And suddenly a sound came out of the heaven, as borne along by the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And tongues of, as of fire appeared to them, being distributed. And what did it do? It sat upon each of them. It didn't say... No, this one here wasn't destined ahead of time to be full of the Spirit. So I'm going to skip this one. Rested on all of them. Amen? And they were all filled of the Holy Spirit. What was the evidence of it? They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Remember back in Isaiah what it said about that? I'm going to put words in your mouth, and they're not going to depart out of your mouth. They're not going to depart. What did Paul say? I'm glad that I speak in tongues more than anybody. Why? Because it's not enough for the Spirit to be upon me. He needs to be coming out of me all the time. Amen? You know, there's a humility in this, in operating in this. If, if, the, if it's true, if it's not a pride element where you think, well, I speak in tongues more than anybody else. You know, if it's not, but when you, when you really have a true understanding of it, you realize that you are desperate for it, right? Yeah. And that you can't, you can't be effective without it. So you do it out of necessity, out of expedience. Jesus said that. He said it's, it's expedient, right? Yeah. So we do this. I want to encourage us in this. I want to take just a little bit of time. Can we take just a few minutes here? I, I, I just want to encourage us to be able to tarry in the Spirit. Well, that was something that, that I grew up being talk, talked about is tarrying in the Spirit. And you don't, you don't have to tarry to be filled with the Holy Spirit necessarily, not like they did at the, in the upper room. But sometimes you need to stay praying in the Spirit for a while. Yeah. Amen? He needs to hover. He needs to produce. Maybe he's got more to say than just a shandai akilei, you know? Maybe he's, got, maybe he's got a few more things that he wants to come out of your mouth. You know, there was one passage I was looking at. Um, I forget where it was found, but it, oh, it was Job. Uh, and he went through a whole list of stuff about how great God is. And then he gets to the, whole, the end of it and he said, and these are just a few whispers about how great he is. We don't even begin to touch how great he is. Volumes are, wrought, uh, are written about human beings. Right? And then we think that we can just talk to God for just a little while and, and it's over with. You, you know what I mean? He's a God that's full of volumes. Right? I would like for us just to, uh, just to take a few moments here. I want to pray for Seth again.
I want to pray for Haley. And I just, want to, I, I just want for us to humble ourselves in consideration of what we've talked about here tonight. I want to just humble ourselves and say, God, we consider what we have in us to be of great, powerful force. Amen? Yeah. I'm thankful that I, I love to pray. I went up and prayed for, for Seth, you know, and I, I thought about asking him if I could go in there sometime when nobody else was in there. So I'd just like to be able to just pray for him, just myself. You know, and I don't know if that's possible or, or what, but I, and I like to pray in my understanding, but I would like for us just to, there's something about when we come together and agree too, that there is, there is a magnifying, there, there's more to this spirit thing than, than we can begin to understand. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And we need each other. We need to pray together. That there's a prayer of agreement that we can have. That when we come together, we're we're agreeing on something together. But what is the what is the effective thing? Is we can pray in our understanding a little bit, but we need to pray the spirit. We need to allow the spirit to hover. Amen. And we need to activate this thing that we've got inside of us. And for my